which is nowadays called MRI. So those of you who have had that kind of scan, yeah, it was him. <laughs> However, with all the names that I have been throwing at you, if there's one name that you remember walking out from this talk, this is the name I want you to remember, Professor James Rainwater. And he is the first person who I've mentioned in this talk whom I knew personally. Um, uh, he was director of Nevis for a while. He won the Nobel Prize in 1975 for work that he had done in the 1950s. He was very fond of telling these stories. Back then, and perhaps now to this day, I don't know, when you win the Nobel Prize, they call you at 10 a.m. Sweden time. That's 3 a.m. our time. So the phone rings at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he picks it up, and he's told he's won the Nobel Prize. So of course he thinks it's a crank call. And then after he is convinced that it is a real call, his next question was, for what? Because he didn't really think his work <laughs> justified the Nobel Prize. Um, but when it he did, um, but where he fits in with this story is you can think of him as the guiding light behind the cyclotron. He was as part of the original team that designed the cyclotron in the first place. Over the years, he, through experience, through expertise, and through other people leaving, became the one who was the most knowledgeable about how the cyclotron worked and what could be done with it. He supervised the cyclotron upgrades because just because you have the most powerful particle accelerator in the world doesn't mean you're content with that. You continue to try to make it more powerful. You can ask John Parsons here after the talk about the work that's being made to make the Atlas, uh, I'm sorry, the Large Hadron Collider, currently the most powerful uh, particle accelerator in the world, even more powerful. You never rest on your laurels. But it became harder and harder as the years go on, the years went on. The funding from Nevis started coming from the National Science Foundation, and they were sometimes skeptical of of Rainwater's claims that the upgrades could be made and do what he wanted them to do. He even built a one-quarter scale model of the cyclotron to prove that his techniques were work, and still the National Science Foundation gave him a whole lot of hassle before proving anything. And it was, uh, it was quite a, a lot of work on him, quite a lot of work for him. Um, eventually, he, uh, eventually, he acquired a debilitating disease. During the time that I knew him, he was walking on two canes. And his son died in a tragic accident, and the heart just went out of him. He couldn't fight the fight with, for the, the National Science Foundation anymore. Um, but there is a bench dedicated to him uh, outside the, uh, the research building over there in the parking lot. You're going to walk past that bench as you walk to the mansion house for the wine and cheese afterwards. You give your heart, your, and your life, and your expertise to a place, and you get a bench, you don't graduate and you get a statue. <laughs> were here in this room, number one, he would be very offended by my showing the slide of him. But number two, he would like to, be, to mention his name as briefly as possible and instead at least try to give you a picture of the science that we did here at Nevis. We spent $30 million, adjusted to 2015 money, of your money. You might as well know what we were trying to do with that money. The Nevis Synchrocyclotron did Meson physics. And rather than go into details, I'll let you read this, uh, read this text on your own. Instead, I'm going to describe it in abstract terms. This little grid here of particles is the standard model, model of particle physics. If you've been attending science on Hudson Talks before, you've seen this before. If you continue to attend science on Hudson Talks, you're going to see it again. We're real proud of this. <laughs> So what Nevis did, along with many other institutions, I do not want to claim that we were the only ones who were doing this kind of work, is fill in the gaps in this chart. In making that statement, I have to be very, very careful. In the 1950s, this chart was not yet part of the physics theories that were an extent. This didn't come up until about the 1970s. Let me use an analogy for you. Talk, think about chemistry. 
starting, you know, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, they were accumulating uh, the knowledge of the properties of the chemical elements. Their melting points, their boiling points, their densities, their colors, their conductivity, and so forth. Then, once you have these properties, you begin to start putting them together and seeing if you could form a pattern. And that's what Mendeleev did. He came up with the periodic table of elements. I guess everybody here has seen that picture. Once you have the periodic table of elements, you can start looking for patterns within that periodic table. The noble gases, the lanthanides, the alkali metals, and so forth. And then you become aware that there is an underlying reality underneath that periodic table, the way electrons are organized within atoms. So that is, in rough terms, what the Nevis synchrocyclotron was doing, building up a collection of properties that would eventually fill this table. To give an example, meson physics is what it was called back then, and we worked with pions and muons. Back then, pions and muons were thought to be kind of the same kind of thing. But now we know that the muon deserves its own little separate entry in this table, but a pion is a composite uh, particle consisting of a combination of up and down quarks. Now, in addition to just doing work at the synchrocyclotron, the people at Nevis worked on designing experiments here and then taking those experiments to other laboratories where the, the equipment and the accelerators there were more appropriate for the kind of physics that had to be studied. And one of the most famous of, that kind of, of those discoveries during the time that we're talking about was the discovery of the muon neutrino in 1962, which run these three gentlemen, uh, Jack Steinberger, Mel Schwartz, and Leon Letterman, the Nobel Prize in 1985. To put it in the terms that I was just discussing before, um, what they discovered is that this, uh, prior to this discovery, the neutrino was thought to be just one thing, and they broke it, uh, the, the categories into two different ones, the electron and the muon neutrino. Uh, last month, Leslie Camilleri went into a great deal of detail uh, about their experiment, and uh, it will eventually show up on the YouTube channel for Nevis. I mentioned that the heart went out of rainwater, and in 1978, with nobody with that kind of fire to continue the defense, the National Science Foundation said...